essence of Thomism. I have already tried to emphasize the point that the inner development of the West, which found its final expression in scholasticism, cannot be explained merely as a development in abstract thought, but that behind it there was a real step forward in the evolution of the soul of Western humanity. What I mean is this. In the study of the history of philosophy, attention is generally directed to the thought of each philosopher, and we note how the ideas which we find in a philosopher of the 6th, 7th, 8th, or 9th century are further developed by philosophers of the 10th, 11th, and 12th, or 13th centuries. From such an approach, we get the impression that each thinker has taken over the ideas of his predecessors and that we are in the presence merely of a certain evolution of ideas. Now this is an explanation of the spiritual life of man which we must learn to reject. For what appears to take place in this way merely is the result of the action of certain individuals really points to something deeper which lies behind the outer scene of events. The underlying factor in scholasticism was an evolutionary development in the very nature of Western humanity, which had begun two centuries before Christianity was founded and which continued right up to the time of the scholastics. Unless we take this factor of inward development into account, it is as impossible to get an explanation of this period of history as it would be to get an explanation of the period of human growth between the ages of twelve and twenty, if we did not consider the important influence of those forces which are connected with adolescence, and which during these years rise to the surface from the depths of human nature. That which surged up in this way during this period from the depths of European humanity was the developing consciousness of human individuality. I have already illustrated this by a comparison of the opening words of Homer's Iliad and of Klopstock's Messiah. When Klopstock wrote his Messiah in, 70, in 1750, the consciousness of individuality in each soul had become universal. But the beginnings of the inner urge toward it can be clearly traced in the period between the founding of Christianity and the age of scholasticism, although in the thoughts of the philosophers of this period we get only the merest surface reflections of this awakening. It was an important fact, however, in the spread of Christianity throughout these centuries, that those who took the lead in spreading it had to address themselves to a humanity which, in the depths of its being, was striving more and more toward this inner consciousness of self. <clears throat> Only by keeping this point of view before us can we understand the conflicts which took place in the souls of such people as Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas, who, from the very depths of their being, wanted to get to the heart of the relationship between Christianity and philosophy. Authors of the history of philosophy have often understood so little of the true nature of these soul conflicts that this epoch is not at all clearly depicted in their histories. On the surface, it looks as if Albertus Magnus, who lived from the 12th into the 13th century, and Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th, had only wished to create a logical harmony between Augustini Augustinism on the one hand and Aristotelianism on the other. Thomas was the representative of the ideas of the Church, Albertus of those of highly developed philosophy. The attempt to bring these into agreement runs like a thread through everything either of them wrote. Now, in the whole system of thought which arose in this way, and 
in so doing brought into full flower the feeling and will of the Western world, there was a great deal which did not survive into the period which extends from the fifteenth century to our own day, the period from which we have drawn our customary ideas for the sciences and for the whole of our daily life. The man of today finds it really incredible when he hears that Augustine actually believed that all mankind, as a result of original sin, deserved to perish, but that a part of mankind, and that without earning it, was destined from the beginning of time to receive God's grace and be spiritually saved, while another part was doomed to be spiritually lost, no matter what its deeds were. To a modern man it probably appears a quite meaningless paradox. But if you can get the feeling of that age in which Augustine lived and in which he absorbed all those ideas and influences to which I have already referred, you will think differently. You will find it possible to understand how Augustine was immersed in the struggle between the older thought which regarded mankind as a unity, and the new thought which was trying to crystallize the individuality of man out of this collective humanity. He himself wanted to hold on still to the point of view of the ancient philosophers, who did not take into consideration the individual man, but, influenced by the Plotinistic ideas which I have outlined to you, kept in mind solely the idea of universal humanity. At the same time, in Augustine's own soul, there was already stirring the impulse toward human individuality. It is for these reasons that his ideas are such a revelation of his own inner conflict and are so compact of human life and feeling that they awaken in us an intense sympathy for this man whose figure dominates the scene in the centuries which preceded scholasticism. After the days of Augustine, the individual man of the West, for the most part, still felt in himself a firm attachment to the Christian Church, and it was chiefly on Augustine's teaching that this feeling was based. On the other hand, Augustine's ideas of predestination could not be accepted by Western people generally, for they rejected the thought of regarding the whole of humanity as one unit, and themselves as nothing more than a member of that whole. Still less the possibility that they might be a member of that part whose lot is destruction and annihilation. The Church, therefore, had felt compelled to find a way out. Augustine was still conducting his fierce fight against Pelagius, the man who was already filled with the individuality impulse of the West. Pelagius was that person in whom, through a contemporary of Augustine, we can see in advance the full sense of individuality which later centuries possessed. It was inevitable, therefore, that Pelagius should maintain that it is quite impossible to believe that man must remain entirely without participation in his destiny in the material spiritual world. Footnote, quote, everything good and everything evil, in respect of which we are either worthy of praise or of blame, is done by us, not born with us. We are not born in our full development, but with a capacity for good and evil. We are begotten as well without virtue as without vice, and before the activity of our own personal will there is nothing in man but what God has stored in him. Close quote Pelagius from Pro Libero Arbitrio. End of footnote. The power by which the soul finds its connection with that which raises it from the entanglements of the flesh to the serene regions of the spirit, where it can find release and return to freedom and immortality, this power, he held, must be born of man's individuality itself. This was the point which Augustine's opponents stressed, that each man must find for himself 
the power to overcome those tendencies which are classed as original sin. The Church stood halfway between the two points of view and sought a solution. <laughs> there was much discussion concerning the solution. All the pros and cons were considered, and then the theologians took the middle way. I can leave it to you to judge whether in this case it was the golden or the copper mean, but in, at any rate they took the middle way, semi-Pelagianism. A formula was found, which was really neither black nor white, to this effect. Quote, it is as Augustine has said, but not quite as Augustine has said, nor is it quite as Pelagius said, but in a certain sense it is as he has said. Close quote. The final conclusion was that it was not through a decree of divine wisdom that some are condemned to sin and others to grace, but that man has some share himself in becoming either a sinner or one filled with grace. In fact, the question is not one of divine prejudgment, but of divine foreknowledge. God knows beforehand whether one man will be a sinner or the other filled with grace. At the time when this dogma was promulgated, it does not appear to have been realized that the point at issue is really not between divine prescience and prejudgment. It is, rather, a question of coming to an absolutely clear decision as to whether or not the individual is able to ally himself with those powers in his own soul life which can raise him up out of his separation from the divine spirit being of the world and lead him back to it. This theological question remained unsolved. Now, when we come to Albertus and Aquinas, we find that while, on the one hand, they felt bound to recognize the dogmas of the Church, and were also filled in their deepest feelings with profound respect for the greatness of Augustine, on the other hand, they stood face to face with the evolution of the individuality consciousness of the West within the stream of Christianity. We must give far more weight to this fact of individuality consciousness in considering the scholasticism of Thomas and Albertus than we should have to give to a similar phenomenon in our own day. The reason for this is that it was due to the upthrust of the consciousness of individuality among the scholastic thinkers that we get in them the perfect flowering of logical judgment and of logical technique. For quite apart from the question of content, whoever has a sense for the form and manner in which any scientific or other subject should be set out with absolute accuracy of thought, and who can appreciate how the relationship between things should be expressed in logically related ideas, will realize that thought was never so exact, so logically consistent either before or afterward, as in the age of scholasticism. The essential quality in it is that pure thought runs with such mathematical certainty from idea to idea, from judgment to judgment, from conclusion to conclusion, that these thinkers account to themselves for the smallest, even the tiniest step. Footnote, quote, If, for instance, we speak in the scholastic sense, of the relation of a concept to that which it represents, we are required in the first place to work our way through lengthy definitions in the scholastic writings. We must understand what is meant when we find it stated that the concept is grounded, quote, formally, close quote, in the subject, and, quote, fundamentally, close quote, in the subject. Namely, that the particular form of the concept is derived from the subject, and its content from the object. That is but a small, quite a small example. The study of scholastic work involves laboring through massive volumes of definitions, a most unpleasant task for the scientist of today. For this reason he looks upon the scholastics as learned pedants and condemns them out downright. He is totally unaware that true scholasticism is not but the detailed elaboration of the art of thinking. <laughs>
in order that thought may provide a foundation for the genuine comprehension of reality. Close quote by Rudolf Steiner from Title Philosophy and Anthroposophy, page 40, end of footnote. <clears throat> we have only to remember, of course, in what surroundings this thinking took place. It did not take place in the midst of the noisy world as it does today. It took place in the cloister, or somewhere far from the world. It was a thinking that was absorbed in the life of thought, and was also able, through other circumstances, to arrive at a pure thought technique. As a matter of fact, it is very difficult today to build up such a pure activity of thought. For no sooner do we seek to make public any such thought activity in which the sole aim is to allow thought to follow thought in accordance with their content, then along come stupid people, raising every conceivable objection and interposing their violent prejudices. In such circumstances, the, that inner quiet is very soon lost to which the thinkers of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries were able to devote themselves. For in the life of their day, they were not compelled to pay such disproportionate attention to the opposition of the uneducated. These were the conditions which produced in this epoch that wonderfully flexible yet clearly outlined activity of thought which distinguishes scholasticism, and for which people such as Albertus and Thomas consciously and earnestly strove. Let us consider once again the situation which confronted them. On the one hand they were dealing with formulated dogmas, which in the light of everyday life appeared to be insufficiently thought out such as the semi-Pelagianism which I have described to you. On the other hand, they felt that what they were striving to uphold had to be upheld because the authority of the Church was behind it, and they sought to uphold it with the most subtle thought possible. One can imagine what is involved in lighting up with subtle thought what I have described as Aug Augustinism. In addition to this, we can trace in both Albertus and Thomas the effect of several influences from earlier times, though it is plain that they themselves were not fully conscious of them. They enter their thoughts, but they cannot give precise expression to them. It is very important to look closely into this inner aspect of this scholastic struggle, and not to attempt to explain the stream of thought from the patristic age of the to, excuse me and not to attempt to explain the stream of thought from the patristic age to the scholastics by all kinds of superficial ideas for in the souls of the scholastics a great deal took place unconsciously we can only arrive at a right understanding if we look back to the period which i described to you in the first lecture and consider that figure which in the sixth century entered half mysteriously into the spiritual life of Europe and became known under the name of Dionysus the Areopagite. Time does not suffice to enter into all the disputes as to whether there is any truth in the view that the writings which bear his name were first made in the sixth century, or whether the other view is right, which ascribes at any rate the original element in them to a much earlier time. After all, that is not important. What is important is that the philosophy of Dionysus the Areopagite was available for the thinkers of the 7th and 8th centuries right up to the time of Thomas Aquinas, and that his writings contain in a special form, but throughout with a Christian tinge, that which I have outlined to you as Plotinism, that is, the Neoplatonism of Plotinus. The attitude of the author of the Dionysian writings to the problem of the ascent of the human soul to the vision of the divine became a matter of the greatest importance for Christian thinkers from the 6th century right up to the time of the scholastics. Footnote. The first mention of the Dionysian writings, parenthesis of which four survive, titled Concerning the Heavenly Hierarchies, 
second title concerning the ecclesiastical hierarchy third title concerning the divine names and fourth title concerning mystical theology close parenthesis is in the year 553 when at a council held in Constantinople Severus patriarch of Antioch appealed to them in support of monophysite teaching they were widely read in the Eastern Church and influenced the thought of the great Greek theologian St. John of Damascus. They were known to the West by the 7th century and became popularized through the Latin translation of Scotus Origina. The first English translation was made in the 14th century when, according to an old chronicler, quote, the mystical divinity ran across England like deer. Close quote. Evelyn Underhill regarded both Augustine and the Areopagite as the spiritual children of Plotinus, but considered that the influence of Augustine on the history of mysticism was as nothing compared with that of the Areopagite. From the ninth to the seventeenth century, she says, his works, quote, quote, nourished the most spiritual intuitions of men and possessed an authority it is now hard to realize, close quote. That brilliant scholar, C. E. Rolt, who translated and edited the divine names and the mystical theology in 1920 believe them to be quote the chief of the literary forces molding the mystical theology of Christendom Roycebrook slaked his thirst at their deep well close quote uh, and Evelyn Underhill's quote is from her book Mysticism appendix page 546 C.E. wrote his quote is from his book Dionysus the Areopagite Introduction end of footnote Dionysus is generally described as having two paths to the divine, and so indeed he had. The first path is as follows. If a man wishes to raise himself from the external things which surround him in the world to the divine, he must seek to derive from all these external things their full perfection, their real nature. From these he must then attempt to get back to absolute perfection, and he must be able to attach such a name to this divine absolute perfection that he gives it a content which can both manifest its own being and at the same time, by individualization and differentiation, account for the individual things found in the world. Thus you may say that for Dionysus the divine is that being to which the widest possible range of names must be applied, a being who must be described in the most superlative terms that can be derived from all that is most perfect in the created world. Find these perfections and apply them to the divinity, and then you can arrive at some idea of the divine. That is one path that Dionysus propounds. The other path is quite different. In regard to this, he says, that you will never attain divinity if you attach to it as much as one single name. For the whole soul activity which you employ in finding the perfections in created things, or which you expend on seeking the true nature of those things in order that you may combine them, and apply them in their totality to the divine, all this never leads to what can be called, quote, knowledge of the divine, close quote. For this you must arrive at a state of mind in which you have freed yourself from all that you have known in created things. You must banish absolutely from your consciousness everything that you have experienced of things. You must be completely unaware of anything that the world says to you. You must forget all the names which you are accustomed to give to things, and you must transpose yourself into a condition of soul in which you know nothing of the whole world. If in your soul you can reach this experience, then you are experiencing, quote, the nameless, which, close quote, which is such that if you attach any name to it, all knowledge of it immediately disappears. Then you have the knowledge of God, the supreme God in His absolute beauty. 
<laughs> but even the words, quote, supreme God, close quote, and quote, absolute beauty, close quote, disturb the experience. They can only serve to point toward that which you must experience as, quote, the nameless, close quote. How can one deal with a personality who gives not one theology but two, one positive and one negative, one rationalistic and one mystical? Whoever can put himself into the spiritual atmosphere of the time in which Christianity was born can understand it perfectly. If, of course, one pictures the development of human evolution in the first Christian centuries in the way in which the materialistic thinkers of today do, then anything like the writings of Dionysus the Areopagite appear absurd and nonsensical, and by most people they are just disregarded. If, however, one can put oneself into the experience and feeling of that time, then one realizes that a man like the Areopagite was really seeking to arrive at a solution of a problem which countless other people were trying to solve, all of whom had made the discovery that whichever path they took, divinity was unknowable along that one path alone. For Dionysus, the divinity was a being who had to be approached by a rational path, by the finding and giving of names. But he saw that to travel by this path only is to lose the way, and also to lose oneself in what might be called, quote, universal space void of God, close quote. In that case, one would not attain to the divine. Yet this rational path must be followed, for unless it is taken, it is impossible to arrive at God at all. Therefore, in conjunction with it, another way must also be taken, namely the way that strives toward, quote, the nameless, close quote. If a man takes either path alone, he will never find the divine. But if he takes both paths, then he will find the way to the divine from that point at which the two paths meet. It is of no value to argue as to which path is the right one. Both are right, but either, taken alone, leads to nothing. But when the human soul finds itself at their meeting place, then both roads together lead to the desired goal. I can understand that some people today who like to indulge in philosophical disputation will dissent entirely from what is here advanced about the Areopagite. But what I have described was fully alive in the consciousness of the men who were the leading spiritual personalities in the earliest centuries of Christianity and it continued to live on as a tradition in the Christian philosophical movement of the West, right up to the time of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. It is to be found, for example, in that individual of whom I have already spoken, Scotus Origina, who lived in the ninth century at the court of Charles the Bald. The reaction of many people to Scotus Origina will remind you forcibly of what I told you about that gentle historian of philosophy, Vincenz Knauer, and that able and respectable philosopher, Franz Brentano, how they both lost their temper and became abusive whenever they had to make any reference to Plotinus. In the same way, those who, with a wealth of discernment and brilliance of intellect, incline more or less toward rationalism, will be angry when their intelligence is confronted with this final and significant revelation of the teaching of the Areopagite, as it appeared in Scotus Origina. In the last years of his life, Origina was a Benedictine prior, but, with, but his own monks, so the legend goes, tortured him to death with pins because he introduced Plotinism in the ninth century. I do not say the legend is literally true, 
but there is a great deal of truth behind it. Now, the ideas of Scotus Origina survived him, and in doing so carried on the teaching of the Areopagite. The writings of Scotus Origina more or less disappeared until later days, when they were recovered. In the twelfth century he was declared a heretic, though that did not mean as much then as it did later, or as it does today. In spite of this, Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas were both deeply influenced by the ideas of Scotus Origina. This is one of the influences from earlier times which we must recognize when we consider the essential teaching of Thomism. Footnote, quote, John Scotus Origina has been regarded both as a belated Neoplatonist and as the first of the scholastics. He was deeply influenced by the forms of Neoplatonic thought, transmitted through Dionysus, whose works he translated into Latin. And his own speculations soon excited the suspicion of ecclesiastical authority. His greatest work, the De Divisiona Natura, was in 1225 condemned by Pope Honorius III to be burned. Scotus had, however, begun the characteristic movement of Christian scholasticism, and Dionysus had been made current in Latin just at the moment when the knowledge of Greek had all but vanished from the West. The first period of scholasticism presents a great gap between Scotus and the next considerable thinkers, who do not appear before the latter part of the eleventh century. Those quote from Thomas Whitaker's titled The Neoplatonists, pages 187-188. End of footnote. There is also another influence to consider. In Plotinism, which I have tried to describe to you in regard to its cosmology, there is a very important presentation of the nature of the human organism, which is derived from a material, supermaterial point of view. One acquires respect for these views when one rediscovers them for oneself out of the basic facts of spiritual science. It must be admitted that if anyone, without preparation, reads anything like Plotinism or what has come down to us of it, it appears somewhat chaotic and intricate. But if one discovers the corresponding truths oneself, then the views in question take on a quite different appearance in spite of the fact that the form in which they were expressed in those days was quite different from what it would be today. Plotinus is dealing with the problem of the relation of the physical and spiritual psychic characteristics of human nature. He considers it from two aspects. First of all, from the point of view of the creative working of the soul upon the body. I will try to express Plotinus's argument in modern terms. If he would have said, you consider a child growing up in the world, you will notice how its body gradually matures. Now that body is the direct product of the spiritual psychic element in the child. For Plotinus, everything which appears in the form of matter, especially in man, is, if I may use the expression, a, quote, sweating out, close quote, or a, quote, crustacean, close quote, of the spiritual psychic. In other words, we are concerned, in the first place, with a spiritual psychic activity, out of which the bodily form is created or fashioned. From this point of view, the physical human organism is the product of the spiritual psychic. The other aspect arises when a human being has reached a certain stage of physical growth and the spiritual psychic forces cease to work formatively upon the body, when a certain stage of maturity has been reached by some part of the living physical organism, let us say, for example, that part on which those forces of the soul have worked, which at a later stage appear as the forces of memory then these soul forces, which hitherto have worked upon the body, make their appearance in a spiritual psychic metamorphosis. In other words, 
that part of the spiritual psychic element which in the first place functioned in a material way, now when its material work is finished, liberates itself from its relation to the material and appears as an independent spiritual psychic entity. These are the two aspects of the relationship between the spiritual psychic and the physical which Plotinus presents to us. It is extremely difficult to convey these ideas with our modern concepts, but I will try to explain it in this way. You all know how a human being, when his powers of memory have developed, is able to remember in a way that was impossible to him as a little child. Where have his powers of memory come from? In his earliest years, they were at work in his physical organism, actually forming it. When that work was complete, they were liberated as pure spiritual psychic forces. They continue to function in the body, but now in a spiritual psychic way, as memory. They have become what Plotinus would call a soul mirror. And finally, within this soul mirror, there dwells the real kernel of the human being, the ego. These two aspects of the life of the soul are worked out by Plotinus with a wealth of description and in vivid concepts. In the first place, that of the active, formative working of the soul, and then that of the soul as surviving its activity and becoming, so to speak, passive in regard to the outer world, so that as it does in the memory, it receives and retains within itself the impressions of the outer world. This twofold work of the soul was derived from the feeling and world outlook of an older level of humanity. It came to its final expression in Plotinus and from him passed on to Augustine and his followers. Rationalized and expressed in more physical concepts, we find this same view of human nature in the philosophy of Aristotle, six hundred years before Plotinus. Aristotle, in his turn, got the view from Plato and from the earlier sources on which Plato depended. When we read Aristotle, we can see that he is striving to express in abstract concepts what he found in the old philosophies. Thus, in the Aristotelian system, which continued to flourish right up to the days of Albertus and Thomas, and which expressed in a rationalized form what Plotinus expressed in an intuitive way, we see, as it were, a rationalized mysticism, a rationalized description of the spiritual secrets of the human being. Now Albertus and Thomas were conscious of the fact that Aristotle had reduced to abstract concepts something which others before him had received in direct intuitive perception. And for this reason, they do not stand in at all the same relation to Aristotle as do the present-day philosopher-philologists. There's a uh, footnote, see Appendix 2, Aristotle, page 161, end of footnote. These latter have developed strange controversies over two conceptions which are found in Aristotle, Owing to the fact that the writings of Aristotle have not come down to us complete, we find both these conceptions in them, without any statement as to how they are related to one another, a fact which gives room for great difference of opinion between many learned disputants. Two ideas are to be found in Aristotle side by side. In the first place, he sees in human nature something which brings into unity in man the vegetative principle, the animal principle, the lower human principle, and finally the higher human principle. This Aristotle calls the, quote, nous, N-O-U-S, close quote. The scholastics call it the intellect. On the other hand, Aristotle differentiates between the nous poeticos and the nous patheticos between the active and the passive spirit element in man. 
these expressions are no longer as descriptive as they are in the Greek. Nevertheless, we can use them and say that Aristotle differentiates between the active understanding, the actively working spirit in man, and the passive understanding. We shall not understand what he means by this until we get back to the origin of these two concepts. Just like the other forces of the soul, the two kinds of understanding in Aristotle are manifest in a metamorphosis of their own in the building up of the human being. For in Aristotle, the understanding in its practical work of building up the human being is not like the memory in Plotinus, which, you will remember, first completes its creative work and then liberates itself from its creative activity in order to appear as memory. In Aristotle, the understanding continues its creative work on the human organism all through life as the understanding, that is the nous poeticos, which in Aristotle's view individualizes itself out of the universe and continuously builds up the body. This is none other than the, quote, active body-building soul, close quote, of Plotinus. On the other hand, that which according to Plotinus liberates itself from its creative activity and then only exists in order to receive impressions from the outer world and to relate logically the impressions it receives, this is for Aristotle the nous patheticos, the passive understanding, the, quote, intellectus possibilis, possibilis, close quote, of scholasticism, footnote, possibilis uh, equals potential in contrast with the intellectus agens, or agens, sorry, I'm not much on Latin there, agens, agens, which is the active intellect, end of footnote, apologies. <clears throat> These concepts presented to us in scholasticism in keen dialectic and precise logic are derived from what had survived from the teaching of the past. We cannot properly understand the working of the souls of the scholastics unless we take into consideration this intermixture of age-old tradition. It was because these concepts were alive in the souls of the scholastics that they were confronted with the great question that is usually regarded as the special problem of scholasticism the problem of knowledge and reality. In earlier times, when men still had powers of vision which produced such a philosophy as Platonism, or the rationalized, diluted version of it in Aristotelianism, when as yet the consciousness of individuality had not reached full development, these problems of scholasticism could not have existed. For the words in quotes, understanding, and in quotes, intellect, in the restricted sense in which we use them today, are found for the first time in the terminology of scholasticism, and are the product of man conscious of himself as an individual, and are the product of man conscious of himself as an individual. To such a man, the fact that we think alike is due to the fact that all individuals are constituted alike and that the understanding is bound up with the individual organism, which is similar in all men. Of course, inasmuch as we are separate individuals, there are differences in our ways of thinking. <clears throat> but these are shades of difference with which logic as such is not concerned. Logical and dialectical thought is the product of the common human nature of mankind, differentiated amongst individuals. Man, having become conscious of his own individuality, feels that it is in man himself that the thoughts arise, whereby he gains an inward representation of the outer world, and that it is from within man that images and thoughts are correlated in such a way as to give a picture of the world. For he feels that mental images themselves also emerge from within man, 
in the first place those which are connected with individual objects, such as some particular bull or some particular man, say Augustine, and secondly other inner pictorial experiences such as dreams which are not a representation of external objects or events. Beyond these, again, are the images of pure man-created fantasies, examples of which the scholastics saw in the centaur and similar ancient chimera. Confronting these images are the concepts and ideas which illuminate them all, both objective and subjective, as, for example, humanity, the lion species, the wolf species, etc., these concepts and ideas, according to established usage, the scholastics called the, in quotes, universals. All of these, to the man conscious of himself as an individual, appear to arise in and out of himself. You will remember that in the earlier condition of humanity, which I described in the first lecture, when man raised themselves up as it were, to these universals, they perceived them to be the lowest boundary of the spiritual world, which was revealing itself through them to the direct vision of mankind. To those men, the universals, humanity, animality, lionhood, etc., were simply the means whereby the spiritual world, the world of thought reality, was revealing itself and in them their own soul was experiencing an emanation from the supersensible world. In order, however, to have this experience, it was essential that man should not have acquired that consciousness of individuality which, as I have described, developed in later centuries. For the consciousness of himself as an individual led man to say to himself, quote, it is we ourselves who raise ourselves from the things of the senses up to that level where there are other realities, more or less abstract, yet also derived from and existing within our own experience. These are the universals, such as manhood, lionhood, etc. Close quote. Now, the scholastics realized quite clearly that the question of the nature of the universals was not answered simply by saying, as the nominalists did, quote, the universals are merely our ideas, just a comprehensive picture we make of the external world. Close quote. On the contrary, in regard to this question, the scholastics felt themselves to be faced with a problem with which they had to grapple. They formulated the problem in this way. We cannot help creating, out of our own individual consciousness, these general concepts, these universals. But when we look out upon the world, we find there not manhood, but individual men, not wolfhood, but individual wolves. On the other hand, we cannot apply what we formulate as wolfhood and lambhood to the material substance of which individual wolves and lambs consist so that at one time we speak of matter as lamb substance and another time as wolf substance, as though lambhood and wolfhood were only different combinations of matter, and the only reality in the combinations was the matter of which they are composed. The following illustration shows how impossible it is to do this. If we caged a wolf and saw to it that for a time sufficient for its whole substance to be transformed it ate nothing but lamb, then it would consist entirely of lamb substance, but it does not thereby become a lamb. The material substance makes no difference, it remains a wolf. Wolfhood, therefore, is something that cannot be simply and entirely related to the material substance, for from the point of view of matter this wolf is entirely lamb. Nevertheless, it remains a wolf. This problem of the nature of universal ideas is still unsolved, but it is no longer taken seriously. 
the soul of man, at the time of its highest development, wrestled with it with every fiber of its being. For the problem was also directly related to matters of vital concern to the Church. For example, before Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas appeared with their special exposition of philosophy, other people had come forward, such as Rosalind, who had propounded the theory, which they themselves accepted, that these general concepts, these universals, are nothing more than an association of ideas, which we ourselves apply to the individual objects of the external world. The universals, therefore, are nothing but words and names. In this way a sort of, in quotes, nominalism developed, which saw in general concepts, in universals, nothing but words. Rosalyn, moreover, applied nominalism in a very rigid way to dogma, and arrived at the following conclusion in regard to the doctrine of the Trinity. If anything which expresses an association of ideas is only a word, then the Trinity is only a word, and the individual persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, are all that is real. The Trinity is simply a name through which the human understanding grasps these three. Medieval thinkers pushed such points to their ultimate conclusions, and the Church was compelled at the Synod of Soissons to declare Rosalind's views to be a form of polytheism and his teachings to be heretical. Footnote, Rosalind, a canon at Compiègne and a teacher of Abelard, was born about the middle of the 11th century and was condemned at Soissons in 1092. Quote, it is the theologians and not the poets who divide who divide the undivided trinity in the pothouses of Paris, close quote, Helen Waddell from her book The Wandering Scholars, chapter 5, end of footnote. This created a difficult situation in regard to nominalism, for what had originally been a concern of philosophy now became also a concern of theology. Today, of course, we no longer regard such a situation as vital, but in those days it was regarded as a problem of supreme importance. And it was just this problem of the relationship of the universals to particular objects with which both these thinkers, Albertus and Thomas Aquinas, wrestled. For them it was the supreme problem. Indeed, everything else in their teaching is consequential upon this, inasmuch as everything else is colored by their approach to this problem. Furthermore, in the form and manner of their approach, all the forces were at work of which I have spoken to you, the forces which came down as tradition from Plotinus and from Dionysus the Areopagite, after having passed through the soul of Augustine and Scotus Origina and many others. All these forces were present in the special pattern of thought which was expressed first by Albertus and then on a wide philosophical basis by Thomas Aquinas. It was known to them that there had been men who could see beyond concepts into the spiritual world, the world of thought which Aquinas himself speaks of as a real world, in which he perceives the immaterial intellectual beings whom he calls angels. These are not abstractions, they are real beings, but without material bodies. This range of being Thomas Aquinas places in the tenth, in quotes, sphere, for he regards the earth as encircled by the spheres of the moon, of Mercury, of Venus, of the sun, and so on, through the eighth and ninth spheres to the tenth, which was the Empyrean. Footnote, the sphere of the moon, as of the other planets, is the sphere enclosed by its orbit. End of footnote. All these he regards as pervaded by intelligences, and those which man encounters first are those which, as it were, allow that which exists at their lowest boundary to shine down, so that the human soul can experience it. Now, what I have just expressed, in a form more akin to Plotinism, could not have arisen in this form out of the pure feeling of individuality to which scholasticism had just struggled. But in the hearts of Albertus and Aquinas there still remained a belief 
that high up above abstract concepts there was a spiritual reality which was expressed in those concepts. So the question faced them, quote, what is the reality which these abstract concepts express? Close quote. Now both Albertus and Thomas Aquinas had knowledge of the fact of the working of the psychic spiritual upon the physical body and how, when its work on the body is fully completed, the soul becomes a mirror to itself. They also had an idea of how man grows in his own individual life, how he develops from year to year and from decade to decade, entirely through the impressions he receives in his soul from the external world, and through the activity with which he responds to those impressions. And so the thought arose in them that the world which lies manifestly around us is in fact itself a revelation of a super-world, a spiritual world. Indeed, as we contemplate the world and consider the separate minerals, plants and animals in it, we have a sort of feeling that behind them all there is something which is revealing itself from higher spiritual worlds. That behind them all there is something which is revealing itself from higher spiritual worlds. If then, they felt, we observe the world of nature with logical analysis, with every capacity of our soul, and with all our power of thought, we shall become aware of those realities which the spiritual world has implanted in the world of nature. Now we must be quite clear as to each step in this process. First of all, we direct our eyes and our other senses toward the world outside us. In doing this, we are in immediate contact with the world. Then, we turn away from the world, but we retain in the form of memory what we have received from it. Then, we look into our memory, and there, for the first time, there really appear to us the universals, the generalities of things, such as humanity and so on. They appear to us, first of all, within ourselves, in the form of concepts. Albertus and Aquinas both say that if you look back to the reflection within your soul of what it has experienced in the outer world, then you will find the universals in your own soul. You have them there. For you form your concepts of humanity from all the human beings you have met. In this way you possess the universalia post res, that which lives in your soul after its experience of actual material objects. Now, while a man's soul is directed toward actual objects, it has not the same content as afterward, when the objects are, as it were, reflected toward him from within. In direct perception, man stands in immediate, actual relationship to the objects. He actually experiences, therefore, in the objects their own spiritual reality, and only transposes this for himself afterward into the form of universalia post res. Albertus and Aquinas hold that whenever a man through his power of thought, stands in actual direct relationship with his surroundings, with a reality, let us say, which is a wolf, not only in that his eye sees it and his ear hears it, but because he is able to concentrate his thought upon it and to formulate to himself the group concept wolf, at this moment he experiences that which exists invisibly in the object as an ideal reality, and which is not manifest in sense form. In this act he experiences the universalia in rebus, the universals that as spiritual realities are actually present in the objects themselves. Now the difference between these two kinds of universals is not very easy to define because we usually think that what we have within our soul as a reflected image exists in that same form in the object from which it is derived. But it is not so as Aquinas sees it. 
that which a man experiences directly in his soul as an idea and subsequently explains to himself by his understanding is that by means of which he experiences in himself the real, the universal. As regards their form, then, the universals that are to be found in the objects themselves differ from the universals which remain in the soul after contact with the objects. Nevertheless, in their inner essence, they are identical. There you have one of the scholastic concepts which thinkers today do not set before their soul with sufficient exactitude. The universals to be found in the objects and the universals that arise in the mind after contact with the objects are in their essence identical. They differ only in their form. But there is a further consideration. The perception that in the objects of the external world something universal is present in a distributed and individualized form points in its turn to that which I described in the previous lecture as the actual, in quotes, thought world that is met with in the teaching of Plotinus. In this thought world are to be found the same realities which are present both in the material objects and in the human soul after contact with the objects, and which, as we have seen, are identical in their essential nature and differ from each other only in their form. In the thought world these realities are present in yet another form, but still with the same essential nature as the other two. These are the universalia ante res, the universals that were in existence before the objects. They are the universals present in the mind of God and of his divine ministers, the angelic beings. Footnote, the ordinary man sees the universalia post res. Plato could see the universalia in rebus, see page 33. Plotinus could see the universalia ante res, See pages 37 to 38. End of footnote. Thus, what was for an earlier age a direct spirit vision, in which sensory and supersensory images were combined, became later a vision which could only express itself in sensory images. For, as the Areopagite taught, man cannot attach even a single name to that which is revealed to him in supersensible vision, if he is to deal with it according to its true nature. All he can do is to point at it and say that it has in it none of the properties that are to be found in external objects. Thus it came to pass that what had been for men of old vision and had been manifested to them as a reality of the spirit world became for scholasticism something which could only be arrived at by all that accuracy of thought, suppleness of reason, and subtlety of logic of which I have spoken to you today. The problem, which formerly was solved by direct vision, was now brought down into the sphere of thought and of reason. That is the essence of the teaching of Albertus and of Aquinas, the essence of scholasticism. Above all things, scholasticism was aware of the full development of the consciousness of human individuality at which their epoch had arrived, and it saw all problems in their rational and logical form, in the form, that is, in which a thinker must apprehend them. The real struggle of the scholastics was to grapple with the world problem of the nature of spirit reality by means of thought. In this intellectual struggle, scholasticism found itself in the full stream of that church life on which, from different points of view, I have already tried to throw some light. The problem was that of the possibility of human belief in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries. On the one hand, was all that was to be attained by intense thought and penetrating logic. 
on the other were the traditional dogmas of the Church, the whole content of faith. Let us see what attitude a thinker like Thomas Aquinas takes up toward these two points of view. Aquinas asks, quote, Can one prove the existence of God by logic? Close quote. In quotes, Yes, he replies, one can. Footnote from St. Thomas, Title Summa Theologica, 1a, 9, 2, Article 3, and a footnote. He gives a whole series of proofs. One is as follows. The first step in attaining knowledge must be that we approach the universalia in the labus that we direct our attention to actual objects. Owing to the conditions which attain to human consciousness in our day, we cannot by direct vision penetrate into the spiritual world. We can only do it if, by means of our own human powers of thought, we plunge deeply into the external objects and extract from them what we call the universalia in rebus, the universals that are to be found in the objects themselves. Then we can argue back as to how these are related to the universalia anteres. For example, we see the world in movement. One thing always imparts movement to another because it is in movement itself. So, we pass from one thing in motion to another thing in motion and from this to a third. But this cannot be continued indefinitely. We must come to a prime mover. If this mover were himself in motion, we should have to proceed to another mover. In the end, therefore, we must reach a stationary mover. In this way Aquinas reached the, quote, stationary mover, close quote, of Aristotle, the first cause. Albertus also reached the same conclusion, namely that it is inherent in logical thought to recognize God as a necessary first being, a necessary first stationary mover. There is, however, Aquinas pointed out, no such path of thought which leads to the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a belief that has been handed down to us. By human thought we can only arrive as far as testing whether this doctrine is contrary to reason, and we find that it is not. But we cannot prove it. We must believe it. We must accept it as a reality which the human intellect cannot by its own powers reach. <clears throat> In this way scholasticism was brought face to face with another all-important question of that day, quote, how far can the human intellect get by its own powers? Close quote. In the course of its development, it had become involved in quite a special way in this deep problem. The earlier thinkers had faced it and had arrived at an apparently quite absurd conclusion. They had said that it is possible for something to be true theologically and false philosophically. A clear illustration of this, they said, is the dogma of the Trinity, which was accepted as part of the traditional faith, and yet, when subjected to logical thought, might appear incredible. Thus it is quite possible for reason to lead to conclusions other than those accepted by faith. Here, then, was another problem that confronted the scholastics, the doctrine of, quote, the double truth, close quote, footnote. The theory of the double truth originated with the Arabian philosophers. A sharp antagonism sprang up between them and the Islamic theologians. Islam was a religion with a creed imposed by church and state as one that could not be questioned. It was among the Arabian thinkers that the theologian, in quotes, who in Greek and early Christian thought was regarded as engaged in the highest of all sciences, first came to be considered as one who speculated under external authority and in order to establish accepted truth. The Arabian philosophers, claiming freedom in the realm of pure speculation, deferred to theology in popular modes of speech, and so adopted the theory of the double truth. In spite of this, in strict Islamic countries, 
the philosophers were regarded with hostility by the Islamic theologians and were finally reduced to silence. When, however, Arabian philosophy penetrated into Europe by way of Spain, it carried with it the theory of the double truth. Although this was officially condemned by church councils, it held its ground as a defense against heresy. Later, as Aristotelianism gained ground in Europe, it became more widely accepted as reconciling the new learning with Christian Orthodox belief, with the underlying assumption that the apparent contradiction was due to the fact that man had fallen, in quotes, in his reason as well as in his moral nature. <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas, as Steiner shows, rejected the idea of the corruption of reason and substituted for it the idea of the inability of the human reason through the inherent limitations of man's physical nature to penetrate into or pass judgment on the realms of higher theology, which could only be known by faith. See footnote uh, T. Whitaker's, the title, uh, The Neoplatonist, pages 189 to 90. End of footnote. In opposition to this, Albertus and Thomas Aquinas both laid special stress on the need to bring into harmony the content of reason and the content of faith, and to seek to remove any contradiction, at any rate up to a certain point, between the two. In those days this was an unorthodox approach to the problem, for the majority of the most influential church authorities held fast to the doctrine of the double truth, namely that while it is necessary to approach every subject with rational thought, which may lead one to see it in a certain form, faith, on the other hand, can present it in a quite different form, and one must be content to accept both these varying points of view. I think one acquires a sense of the working of history when one considers the fact that these men, living so few centuries ago, were involved with their whole soul in such problems. For these problems still reverberate in our own time. We too are confronted by them. In what way this is true we shall consider in the next lecture. Meanwhile, I want to give a general outline of the real nature of Thomism as it existed in those days. We see then that the main problem which faced Albertus and Thomas Aquinas was this, quote, what is the relation of the content of human reason to that of human faith? How can that which the Church ordains to be believed be first understood and secondly upheld against what contradicts it? Close quote. With this task, Albertus and Aquinas were deeply concerned. For the philosophic theory of the double truth, which I have described, was not the only one in Europe with which they had to contend. Something still remained of that philosophy, which I described in the first lecture as Manichaeism. And with the spread of Islam and the Arabs, other philosophical points of view asserted themselves. For example, there was that which had been derived from the teaching of Averroes, footnotes the Appendix 3, uh, Gundi Shapur, end of footnote, in the 12th century, and was known as the doctrine of, in quotes, representation. Averroes had declared that the thoughts of the pure intellect in any individual man do not belong specially to him, but to all humanity. We have not each of us a separate mind. We all have our own particular body, but not our own mind. A has his own body, but his mind is identical with that which B and C possess. Thus Averroes sees all mankind as with a single intellect. The mind is something in which all individuals are immersed. They live in it with their head, as it were. When they die, the physical body is withdrawn from the universal mind. There is no immortality in the sense of individual survival after death. What survives is only the universal mind, only that part of us which is common to all men. <clears throat> in answer to this philosophy, Thomas Aquinas took up the position that while he admitted the universality of mind 
There was also to be taken into account the fact that the universal mind does not merely attach itself to the individual memory in each man, but also during his lifetime to the active forces of his bodily organism, forming them into a unity. Everything that works in man, the formative vegetable forces of growth, the animal forces, and the force of memory, are all, during life, drawn together, as it were, into a unity by the universal mind and the individual intellect. Footnote. Thomas Aquinas himself wrote, quote, If the active intellect is a substance outside man, the whole of man's activity depends on an extrinsic principle. Man then will not be a free agent, but will be acted upon by another. And so he will not be the master of his own acts, nor deserve praise or blame. And the whole of moral science and social intercourse will perish, quod est inconvenience. Close quote from Summa Contra, Gentiles, Part 2, C. 76, Advin, and a footnote. Thus Aquinas holds that man fashions his individuality by means of that in him which is universal and then takes with him into the spiritual world that which the universal in him has fashioned. It is plain that on this theory there can be for Albertus and Thomas Aquinas no pre-existence, but there is certainly an after-existence. <clears throat> that was exactly the point of view of Aristotle, and in this respect these two thinkers carried on Aristotelianism. Thus the great logical question of the universals is bound up with the questions which concern the ultimate destiny of the individual. Now if I were to take you through the cosmology of Thomas Aquinas and the natural history of Albertus, which are extraordinarily extensive, covering almost every subject and filling countless volumes, you would find expressed everywhere, all through them, what I would call the universal logical principle of Al Albertanism and Thomism. It was this. With our reason, or intellect, as it was then called, we cannot attain all heights. Up to a certain level we can reach everything by accurate logic and dialectic, but at that point we have to enter the region of faith. In this way reason and faith stand face to face without contradicting one another. What we understand with our reason and what is revealed to us through faith can exist side by side. How did this principle actually work out? We can approach this question from many different sides. Let us consider how it worked out in what we have before us historically as the essence of Albertanism and Thomism, namely the justification of religious belief. It is an important and illuminating fact that after exercising his reason to the utmost to prove the existence of God, Aquinas has to admit that he arrives in the end at the same picture of God as the orthodox picture given in the Old Testament as Jehovah. That is to say that when Aquinas starts from the paths of reason open to any individual, he arrives at that same monotheistic picture of the deity which is presented in the Old Testament as the Jehovah God. To arrive at the Christ, however, he holds that one must pass over to the sphere of faith. In other words, in the view of Thomism, man cannot reach the Christ by the inherent power of his own intellect. Now, if we look again at the theory of the double truth, which the spirit of the age compelled scholasticism to oppose, we shall find in it something lying deeper than the mere definition that a thing should be at the same time theologically true and philosophically incredible. It was something which could not be perceived in an age in which mankind was wholly given to the pursuit of reason and logic. It was this. Those who originated the theory of the double truth did not believe that what is revealed to theology and what is to be reached by reason are ultimately two opposed truths, but are so only for the time being. 
and that man has arrived at this double truth because even in this innermost part of his soul he has shared in the fall of man. <clears throat> right up to the time of Albertus and Aquinas, questions like the following still glimmered in the background of the human soul. Quote, Have we not brought original sin into our thinking? into what we see as reason in ourselves? Is it not just because our reason has fallen from its spiritual estate that it presents us with a counterfeit of truth instead of the real truth? If we receive Christ into our reason, then we shall receive into it something which can transform it and develop it further. Then only will it be brought into harmony with that truth which is the content of faith. Close quote. It was against this background of man's sin-corrupted reason that the scholastic thinkers, before the time of Albertus and Aquinas, spoke of the double truth. In considering this problem, they wished to take seriously both the doctrine of original sin and the doctrine of redemption through Christ. The question they asked themselves was this, quote, how does Christ redeem in us the truth of our reason when it contradicts the spiritual truth of revelation? How do we become Christian to the inmost depth of our being? Our reason has already been corrupted by the entry into it of original sin, and it is because of this that it contradicts the pure truth of faith. Close quote. But in spite of their deep earnestness, the early scholastics had neither the thinking power nor the logic to arrive at the answer to their question. Then Albertus and Aquinas came on the scene, and it appeared to them, from the first, to be a wrong belief, that if with pure thought we steep ourselves in the universalia in rebus, if we grasp for ourselves the essential reality that is present in objects, we should be spreading sinfulness over the world. It appeared to them impossible that man's normal reason should be tainted by sin. It is clear that the whole problem of Christology is fundamentally involved in the problem of scholasticism. And the question which the scholastics were not able to answer was this. How does Christ enter into human thinking? How does human thought become permeated by Christ? How does Christ lead human thought up to that sphere where it finds itself in agreement with the spiritual content of faith? Yet this was the very question which had been the original driving motive in the souls of the scholastics. For this reason, it is above all things important that we should not concern ourselves so much with the findings of the scholastics perfect as their logical technique was, but should look behind the answers to the questions they ask themselves. We must disregard the conclusions to which the men of the twelfth and thirteenth centuries fought their way, and consider the great problems which at that time were propounded. It was just because they were not yet sufficiently advanced in their Christology to be able to apply the redemption of man from original sin to human thinking, that Albertus and Aquinas had to deny reason the right to cross the threshold which would have led it into the spiritual world itself. Thus scholasticism left behind it unanswered the question, quote, how can human thinking develop itself upward to a vision of the spiritual world? Close quote. It is not then the actual content of its philosophy, but a question that arises out of it that is the most important outcome of scholasticism. It is the question, quote, how can one carry Christology into thought? How can thought be made Christ-like? Close quote, footnote. There are thus two complementary questions. One, what is the relation of the human reason to the Christology which it cannot logically comprehend? And two, what is the relation of Christology to the human reason which cannot comprehend it? To the first question, excuse me, question, Thomism gave an answer. The second, Thomism, never really visualized and so left unanswered. <clears throat>
and a footnote. <clears throat> this question confronted world history at the end excuse me, at the death in 1274 of Thomas Aquinas, who right to the end had never been able to answer it. It still poses itself most searchingly to the spiritual life of Europe. The only answer that can be given to it at the moment is still that of the scholastics, that man penetrates up to a certain level into the spiritual nature of things, but beyond that lies the content of faith. Reason and faith must not contradict one another. They must be in agreement. Natural reason, however, cannot by its own powers comprehend the content of the highest things, such as the Trinity, or the incarnation of the Christ in the human Jesus. For example, in regard to the creation of the world, reason can only go so far as to say that the world could have been created in time, but that it could also have existed from eternity. Revelation, however, says that it was created in time, and if you ask reason once again, you find grounds for thinking that creation in time is a reasonable and a wiser answer. Thus the scholastic still keeps his place in history. The heritage of scholasticism still survives today, both in science and in the general life of mankind to a greater extent than is generally supposed, although, of course, it survives in a particular form. Exactly how far scholasticism is still alive in us, and what attitude the man of today should adopt toward it, this we shall speak of in our final lecture.